Greetings, I'm Leslie Pollard, president of Oakwood University, and this is Windows on the Word. We are grateful that you have come to, to join us. We're coming to you from the campus of Oakwood University, where weekly we study the scriptures with an eye toward how we apply them to daily living situations, and especially how the scriptures look and are heard through communities that are diverse and multicultural. So with that in mind, we want to turn right to the scripture and we are studying the Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School lesson and looking at it as a point of departure for speaking to the big questions of life, the questions that communities like ours and many around the world actually face. We've got three guests with us today as we are doing this. I want to introduce them to you. First, I want to introduce our own systematic theologian here at Oakwood University, Dr. Ingram London. Welcome, Ingram. Then we want to introduce a senior theology major, Mr. Yes. Chris Dorsey, who is graduating and walking this year yes. and getting ready to move on out into ministry. And we're grateful. Thank you, Chris, for being with us. And then we certainly want to introduce and welcome uh, Pastor Isak Ibarra, who is the special assistant to the president for diversity and inclusion. And if you're wondering what that means, that means that he coordinates the multicultural, multifocal outreach to the more than 54 different countries that are represented in our workforce and in our student body. We've got quite a lesson this week. We really do. It's called an Receiving an Unshakable Kingdom, and it's based on one verse in the book of Hebrews. That verse is Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Hebrews 12, 28. Now, kingdom, kingdom. At the core of so many theologies, Dr. London, is a definition of kingdom. One of the big theologies today that's out there is an area that you are a specialist in, the area of black theology. Now, I have to say, as soon as I say that, many people get scared. They get scared because they say, oh, my goodness, what, 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 what is that now? Not a, not, a, not a gospel's black, right? Not a gospel's black. Um, but, but, but when we talk about black theology, what are the questions that this focus is trying to answer and define it for us? Because very few people don't know. And this is your opportunity to tell millions around the world what it is that you study. Sure, sure. So there, there's no reason to be afraid of that, of that term, <laughs> um, black theology. All, all that term really means is that we are asking theological questions from a black perspective yes. or asking questions that the black community has interest in. Okay, um, I don't want to interrupt you. Yeah. So what it, so for the listener who's never heard this before, mm -hmm. what are some of those kinds of questions? And you, you'll be able to define it, but what are some of those kinds of questions? Right, so, so black theology, what I like to do, I'm, I study systematics, and so I like to work with categories. That's really okay. what system, <laughs> systematics is really about, just creating theological categories. So for me, I break down black theology into three categories, black liberation, uh, black theodicy, and then black dignity. And again, all of this is coming from the black community and trying to answer those questions from a biblical perspective. Um, so, so maybe let's, the so next let's question one, let's is... Take, no, no, let's take them one by one. So black liberation, yeah. black theodicy, and what was the third? Black, uh, black dignity. Black dignity. Right. Okay, so let's start, let's start with black theodicy. Oh, okay. what, was that the one you started with? Uh, that was the second black one, liberation. but that's my... Black liberation. Let's start with sure. liberation. liberation. So with black liberation, the idea there is looking at, well, how can we uh, address the issue of oppression and suffering in the black community and, and find actual tools from scripture to uh, liberate ourselves? Mm -hmm. um, so for example, if you have a situation where you're dealing with segregation or slavery, for example, in our, in our own history, what is it from the Bible? Where has God spoken to that type of situation that we can use uh, as a theological springboard to actually uh, engage in the work of liberation? So you see black theology all throughout our, our history, especially in our churches, regardless of denomination, especially in our use of the Exodus narrative. That's an example, classic example of black theology uh, related to black liberation. Uh, the other categories uh, like black dignity is reconstructing, rebuilding 
uh, black self-image, self, uh, black self-worth, uh, self-esteem even. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, from a biblical perspective, how do we ground black dignity in Jesus Christ? Mm -hmm. And then black theodicy, which is my, my particular uh, area of interest, is actually um, addressing those hard questions of where was God uh, during slavery and mm -hmm. <laughs> where was God and during different atrocities and uh, what uh, Marilyn uh, McCord Adams uh, calls uh, horrendous evils that mm -hmm. have occurred in the black uh, experience. So that's, that's my particular so, so interest. It, so it sounds to me like when we talk about black theology, we're actually, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the listener who may not have any theological fluency or exposure. Mm -hmm. I, we're actually asking the questions of the heart that suffering black people have wrestled with as they have, as they have tried to maintain a faith in God. Correct. Am I right? Am Correct. I right? Am I hearing that? Exactly. So one of the issues that comes up in theology and it especially comes up in, in uh, marginalized communities mm -hmm. is how is it that the Bible can say that God is all powerful and also that he is love? Mm -hmm. Because we don't always see those two aspects of God represented mm -hmm. in, in our own experience. Mm -hmm. If he says he loves us, then why did he allow certain uh, situations to occur in our history. And so that's, that's, the, that's what black theology at its core uh, has to answer. Uh, yeah. Even before liberation and dignity, it's where is God? Where is God in all of this? And, and we, have this we have this in Latino theology. Mm -hmm. We have this in Holocaust theology. Mm -hmm. We can put any adjective mm -hmm. there, yeah. but, but they're the basic human questions of where is God in the midst of our suffering? Mm -hmm. Where, where is God? Where, where? And people ask that individually and they ask it collectively. Yes. Oh no, I was just trying to, this is interesting, I was just trying to see this a cultural aspect. Mm -hmm. My case, mm -hmm. I'm black, mm -hmm. but I'm Latino. Mm -hmm. Is it the mm -hmm. same suffering that I experienced in a Cuba? And, and Cuban, and Cuban. And Cubans. Right, right, right. Uh, does it fall into the same category when we talk about the black, black theology that include all the blacks in the global? or a particular context? Mm. There's, there's been an evolution. So when it started, it was specifically for the, the African-American mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. But now if you go to black theology uh, symposiums and mm -hmm. conferences, it, it actually includes the entire diaspora. So, okay. so yes, it's, it's inclusive. Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Where, wherever black people have suffered, mm -hmm. is, it's, it's wrestling with those big, big, big questions. And black people are not the only people who have suffered, That's right? right. That's That's right. right? We know that, right? <laughs> but we have suffered and we want, we want to know the answer. One of the miracles, I believe, of Christianity, one of, one of the miracles of grace is that we held on to Christianity, mm -hmm. I, I think. Don't you, don't you, Doc? That, that we, we didn't throw it off. I mean, when uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, in, his, in his autobiography, people accused him of not being a Christian. He said, no, 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 no. He said, I love the pure religion of Jesus Christ. He mm -hmm. says, what I'm against is slaveholding religion. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm against. I'm against, and then he uses these terms. I'm against women whipping that kind of religion. He said, mm -hmm. not the, he said, and to love one mm -hmm. is to automatically be the enemy of the other. Oh, yeah. If you love the religion of Christ, then slaveholding religion, you have to hate and you have to speak out against it. He was actually doing black theology, was he not? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. there's, there's really been like two, two camps, I guess you could say, in, in black mm -hmm. theology, where you have uh, black theology that is uh, um, expressly religious. It's, it's not uh, apologetic about being Christian, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but it's a, a different type of Christianity that mm -hmm. emphasizes uh, liberation and, and the love of God. Uh, for all of humanity. But then there's another stream of black theology that uh, leans more towards the, the humanist side, mm -hmm. which it may not be overtly religious, but at the same time, it is very much about loving your neighbor as yourself. So uh, you, you can't say that it's not black theology. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't this interesting, everybody? I mean, it's so, it's so interesting because it's questions of real life. And at the center, Chris, mm -hmm. at the center of much of this is how do you understand the kingdom of God? That was the text we read about the, and receiving an unshakable mm -hmm. kingdom. What is the nature of that kingdom? What did Jesus mean when he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? The desire to see communities be bettered and improved through kingdom principles. Um, 
What, what, what do you all think about this? And, and Isaac, we're going to come back to you, Chris. Mm -hmm. So coming from Cuba, where, where, where you grew up facing communism, right? Mm -hmm. And people suffered. Mm -hmm. um, how was Christian faith, how was the kingdom viewed when you were growing up as a little boy? What did people say about the kingdom? Yes. Well, actually, um, whenever we look at Cuba and in, uh, in the system, um, I believe Castro, in one of his powerful speeches, he said, I am God and the religion is the communism. So, I am God and the religion is communism. Is communism. Wow. Um, and uh, in the season, tried to replace God. Um, as a four years old boy, I was walking down the street and my mother was taken to, to jail just because she had a Bible and she was on the way to do a Bible study. Wow. So I remember experiencing that. And then my father, he served one year in, in, in prison, in the worst prison in Cuba, wow. just because of his belief. You know, mm -hmm. just because he was a Christian, keeping the Sabbath, so he was put in jail. And, um, and as a result of that, that's how our whole family came to the United States, you know. Uh, but when we look at it in the system and the suffering for Christ, um, I even remember um, that they, they put him um, in, the, in the school. In the school, they have something that called devotional, got nothing to do with Christ, everything communism, but it's, it's um, and they used to make bully of Christian, you know. So growing up in that system, I had to realize and develop a God in the kingdom that is unshakable. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That was the only, <clears throat> the only reason where we could actually survive mm -hmm. was about knowing about this kingdom that Jesus established. And it, it's amazing how he talks about the kingdom, not just the kingdom to come, mm -hmm. the kingdom is near. Mm -hmm. And he said mm -hmm. it so many times, the kingdom mm -hmm. is at hand, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that kingdom, growing up in that system, it was, um, it was tough. I can it hear that. I can even hear that, even as you think about it and reflect on it. Um, Chris, you, when you think about your life growing up mm -hmm. in Los Angeles, Thousand Oaks, and you think about the kingdom that's coming and the kingdom that's here, what kind of things come to mind that you think about, especially as it relates to young people? Uh, I would say the thing that comes to mind is, see, I'm a, I'm a history person, so mm -hmm. I love to read and go back and look at, uh, you know, just from the, from the beginning, just to, like, get into that. And what I've noticed is a pattern is that any time that you stand up for Christ and talk, and talk about him, there's going to come a time of tribulation. Yes. Uh, from the early church mm -hmm. when the mm -hmm. Christians were doing the, in the Roman Empire mm -hmm. to the dark ages where more, you have Martin Luther and William Tyndale mm -hmm. actively trying to get people uh, just knowledge of the, of the Bible. And if you just read, if you had a piece of paper of the Bible, mm -hmm. you're automatically going to get executed. And I feel as though when people say, you know, where was God during slavery? Where was God during this and that? Uh, I feel like though he was there, he just has to allow things to play out. If God stopped everything, you know, it'd be like it's all part of prophecy, it's all part of the plan. So, but I feel as though during these uh, hard times, we need to, I would say, renew our relationship with God and help us get stronger. Everybody can always say, I'm a follower of Christ mm -hmm. during the good days. Mm -hmm. But when those bad days come around mm -hmm. and when, you're when your faith is actually tested, then you're going to mm -hmm. see, you know, everybody's going to see, are you really what you say you are? You know, I read in the Book of Martyrs, it said that the Romans had uh, Christian babies and they say that if you renounce your faith, we won't throw them to the, to the lions. Mm -hmm. And it's just so like, mm -hmm. that is, I couldn't even imagine, mm -hmm. you know, the level that's of it. cruelty. Exactly. And it's just as though you have that much faith. That's, that's all you know. That back then, they were deeply in what they believed in. They stood firm in it. And I feel as though we should use all those examples and use them as for t as today because I already know that when it comes for the final days, it's going to be 10 times worse. So, Amen. Yeah, Amen. So. You know, one of the things as we, as we segue to our next segment, one of the mm. things each of you has said, I can tie it together with the notion that there are oppressive powers trying to, I don't want to say create a kingdom, but try to be the kingdom mm -hmm. in their domination of other people, whether it's in Cuba, whether it's in the Roman Empire, 
whether, as we have seen in the history of black people, even with America, someone standing in the place of God, presenting themselves as king and kingdom, and seeking to dominate and oppress and shape people's lives. And the good news of the gospel that we've been studying about from the book of Hebrews is that we've received an alternative kingdom, mm -hmm. a counter kingdom that is an unshakable kingdom. And we'll unpackage that more in our next segment. I have the privilege to be working at this great institution, Oko University, serving the diverse population. In other words, I am serving. And what I do, I do it with joy, I do it with passion, because I see many students that come from different parts of the world. They enter to learn and they depart to serve. Well, welcome back to Windows on the Word. Again, I'm Les Pollard, president of Oakwood. We are here in the beautiful Peters Media Center, and my guests, Dr. Ingram London, Mr. Chris Dorsey, who is graduating as a senior in theology, and Elder Isaac Ibarra, we are talking about the Sabbath school lesson, and we're talking about the kingdom, but we're talking about it from a unique perspective. Colleagues, in the book of Revelation, what we see emerging, especially in the second half of the book, are anti-kingdoms, are counter-kingdoms, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, the book of Revelation is all about the kingdom of God, right? God, mm -hmm. Christ and his kingdom. But, but clearly there are counter-kingdoms, counterfeit kingdoms, who seek to displace the kingdom of God mm -hmm. and to substitute for it force and legality and persecution and coercion and a number of things throughout history. They oppress and they dominate people's lives. Interestingly, and I'd like you to respond to it, the early Adventist pioneers, unlike many of their, what we would say today, their evangelical counterparts, if we could use the term loosely, referring to the 1800s, many of their counterparts saw America as the promised land, but they didn't see it that way. Whether it was J.H. Wagoner mm -hmm. or J.N. Andrews, they saw it as an oppressive power, or James White, Mm -hmm. They saw it as an oppressive power in Revelation chapter 13 that's one day, one day, will completely reverse itself on all of the claims of its founding documents. But they didn't wait to say that's going to happen one day when Sunday blue laws are legislated. Mm -hmm. What they said is we have evidence now that this is happening and that this is the nature of the American Republic based on enslavement. Mm -hmm. it's the, the surest evidence of the hypocrisy of the beast that looks like a lamb but speaks like a dragon, mm -hmm. the surest evidence is the enslavement of these Africans. Mm -hmm. And that was exhibit A. Anybody want to respond to that before we talk about the, the true kingdom, these counterfeit kingdoms? What, why do they, how do they emerge? And what is it in the hearts of human beings that makes them think that they can displace and play God. One of our uh, pioneers, uh, Ellen White, she talks about how the, the spirit of oppression, it originates in Satan. Yes. So there's, there's something about um, the, you could call it the, the, the seed of the serpent, yes. <laughs> maybe, yes. or, yes. Uh, going back to, to Genesis uh, chapter three, that it just arises within humanity where we want to oppress and, and, and dominate other people. And that, that is a manifestation of demonic power. And we want to resist that uh, within ourselves and we want to resist it when people try to dominate us as, as well. Um, but we want to resist it through love. Mm, amen, amen. Isaac, you, yeah, you've well, lived through this. You, you told us in the first segment about your living through this kind of thing in a very direct way within your own lifetime. Yes, and, and I've been thinking how we deal with oppression because even Ellen G. White, since it, she was mentioned, um, she deal with the concept that sometimes we bring persecution to ourselves. Yes. You know, and sometimes we leave ourselves. Um, actually, there's a Bible text that said that the unjust, and I'm paraphrasing because I'm thinking in Spanish, that the unjust 
is the only one that flee without nobody persecuting. <laughs> <laughs> in, in Isaiah, in English, it's the wicked flee when no man pursues. There we that, go. That, thank, you, thank you. Thank you so I know which verse you're yeah. referring to. And then again, if we say, I give an example, going back to Cuba, there's so many people, as a matter of fact, Dr. Moral, he went to prison as well. There's a lot of Cuban. Dr. Moral, for our listeners, Dr. Moral is a religion faculty here teaches in our School of Theology, and uh, just a wonderful witness for Christ. Yes, okay, yes, Dr. thank Moral. you. Okay. And, uh, um, so they suffered in Cuba. They were faithful to God, not working on the Sabbath, and suffered persecution, right? A year in jail, two years, three, four, five years. Then they came to the promised land. Mm -hmm. In the next month, some of those people that suffered persecution, they left their wife with another one. Wow. So then again, we ask ourselves the question, was that pride? Because sometimes uh, we do not give in or give up of our belief, and sometimes it's not even for Christ. So I guess I in the middle of persecution, the question is, is it a persecution that I'm entitled to go through it. And we know with all the COVID and mm -hmm. all that, I think people are still bringing persecution to themselves, going to places because of the gospel, because the interpretation of the gospel, yes. or not taking the vaccination because, mm -hmm. you know. So I think there's a danger in, in the interpretation of the scripture. And sometimes, if we don't have this type of dialogue in the Word of God, sometimes we put ourselves in persecution that God never asks us to be in that position. Oh, I don't know absolutely. if that makes sense. Absolutely. I, I, I think a big piece of my takeaway is that human nature, you know, we, we talk about the fall <clears throat> of humankind, right? And the fall has infected every person, every community, every culture, the fall, the effects of the fall. So often what we find is that people who have been persecuted, when given the opportunity, sometimes, unless they are regenerated, mm -hmm. they will persecute. They will persecute. Mm -hmm. If they've been a victim, they will victimize. They will victimize. Because, uh, and this is where uh, uh, Ingram, when, when I studied a little bit of liberation theology, I saw an, um, the, the myth of the innocent poor of the innocent poor, that you, you, you assign virtue to poverty mm -hmm. when in fact part of what we have to do with the poor is not only care and be voice, but also bring the gospel so that that kind of elevation doesn't repeat itself in the next generation. So once I walk away from being oppressed, I don't turn now and become an oppressor, mm. right? Yeah, remember, remember that, that you were a slave about? in Egypt. Well, there it is, there yes. it is. Deuteronomy, yeah, Deuteronomy. Mm -hmm. He said, now, you, you be sure to treat the stranger this way, this way, this way, and this way. Because remember, you were slaves, and remember how you were treated. Chris? Yeah, no, I, I was just going to agree. Like, it was, those are great points. Um, I just feel like we should, even though we're being oppressed or, and stuff like that, we should just continue to show kind and, lo and love. I yeah. feel as though... At the, end of the, at the end of the day, like we are, we are African Americans, we are Latinos, and everything like that. But at, at first, we're a Christian. Christian, you yes. know, and I, I feel understand. like they should, we should show that. Um, whenever try, people try to get a reaction from us, uh -huh. like for example, right now we're watching Roots in class. <laughs> You guys and are watching, we're roots. watching Roots in class. And, um, are you watching been, the 70s version? The 70s version, oh, yes, okay, yes, okay, yes. Okay. yes. The they redid version. it a few yes, years ago. Yeah, and um, there have been so many times where the main characters are going through some a horrific, lot, things. horrific things. And I already know in real life it was 10 times worse. Right, right, absolutely. And the fact that they were able to show constraint and self-control and, and just be like, no, we're just gonna let you know the Lord deal with them and things like that. It just shows you that if they can do it while being, you know, enslaved and beaten and everything, that we can surely do that as well. So, sure. Yeah. I mean, we see it also in the modern world. Roots would have been, you know, during the enslavement period, yes. but we see it in the civil rights movement as well. Absolutely. We see Dr. King exercising a tremendous amount of redemptive restraint, which Absolutely. he called it redemptive suffering, intended to highlight the atrocity of oppression, mm -hmm. and to win 
the oppressor. I mean, it was a, a miraculous and, strategy, and God blessed that strategy. And I was going to piggyback on that. I feel as though, I feel like that generation, we need to learn off of. I feel as though this generation right here, we have the technology, we have the means to go further and beyond, but I feel as though if we take that same dedication and fire that they had, I feel like we'll be an unstoppable generation because we only do stuff when stuff happens to us. You know, it's never consistent. You know what I mean? Like, for example, the same thing with George Floyd. Mm -hmm. Every The whole world was in revolt, but now it's just like, okay, let's just keep that same pressure and, and just be a consistent over and over again, so. Amen, yeah. amen. I'm, I'm, amen. I'm having a deja vu um, sitting here in the classroom in the history department with Dr. Sepulveda. And I remember that he was making the case in the classroom like the gospel, the seven-day Adventist gospel is good for the poor classes, you know. Uh, that's it, you know. And, and I remember as a student, say, well, oppression is for everybody, you know. <laughs> and the rich are oppressed as well, you know. I said, well, well, you. And then he, he challenged us. I was like, well, show me a church that was planted in like super, you know, good neighborhood and that flourished <laughs> because our gospel is feeding the needs, you know, of the oppression. And I remember having having that that conversation, how Seven Day Adventists, how our gospel, we do a great job of the poor classes bring on to middle classes. Mm -hmm. But from middle classes going up, I don't know if we've our got, gospel. We've got work. I, I think we've got work to do. I think we've got real work to do in that area. I think you've made a point because it's very difficult to go out and to plant a church among the wealthy and the well-to-do. Mm -hmm. their, their lives are occupied, different, etc. Often, too, uh, we, we know that they have a sense of need, but it's not the, it's not a need for mater the, the materials of survival. Mm -hmm. It's not that need. It's different kinds of needs, right? Mm -hmm. Need for health, need for well-being, need for their children. They, they do have needs, but it's but it's a different set of needs. What what we find in the gospel is that Jesus said that the poor you'll always have with you. Mm -hmm. And he also said in his, his, his mission statement, um, Luke 4, 15 through, through 18, mm -hmm. that I am come to bring liberation, to preach the gospel to the poor and to the oppressed. There is a receptivity among the poor. That is, even Jesus himself recognized it. And to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Um, colleagues, I thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you for this conversation about kingdom and, and what it means in our community and how we can take those principles and bring the good news of the gospel to, to people who are hungering for it. Now, brothers and sisters, we thank you for watching Windows on the Word. We want you to know <clears throat> that here at Oakwood University, if you are wondering how can you get more insight, more, um, more engagement, more understanding of these important topics, go to www.oakwood.edu. And consider enrolling in Oakwood University, either at the undergraduate or the graduate level. And if you haven't completed a degree, we also have a degree completion program called LEAP. May God bless you, www.oakwood.edu. We are here to serve you. May God bless you, and we will see you next week on Windows on the Word.